So the summit builder comms is chasing is to help 5 million builders and contractors with their communication. What is going on Summit Chasers and welcome to another episode of the Summit Startup Success Series where we interview and highlight the founders of these businesses and the problems that they're solving, the trials and tribulations that they've had to go through from raising capital to adjusting their target market to adjusting their idea and how they got from where they were to where they are today. Sit back, get your notebooks out, prepare to be inspired and start chasing your summit. What's going on, everybody? I have Ron Nussbaum of Buildercoms, the founder of Buildercoms, and honestly, one of my favorite people of 2023 and 2024, and hopefully beyond. So, Ron, thank you so much for being here, my friend. Hey, Zach. It is fantastic. You're one of my favorite people, too. So I, I'm always excited when we get to connect and have a call, and it's even more exciting when we get to record it and put it out there for other people to listen to. Mm -hmm. Other people get a get to see a little our uh, cohesiveness and hopefully strive <laughs> to find someone that they can do that with themselves. <laughs> Absolutely. So looking uh, back, what was the uh, the most pivotal or a very pivotal moment that set the course for the success you're seeing with Builder Comes and yourself today? Uh, I would say the most pivotal part was when the decision was made. Uh, between me and my wife that this is what we were going to go do. Uh, I think when anytime you're starting to start anything up and you're hooked on like either that salary, or you're not 100% sure, like, should I go all in? Uh, God kind of drew the line in the sand for us. And it was like, now or never, like, let's go do this. And we got to other me and my wife and just made the decision like, this is what we're meant to do. This is what I'm personally meant to do. And once we made that decision, it was off to the races. So without coming to your other and making that decision and having some divine intervention to prove out that this is what I'm supposed to be doing, uh, we wouldn't be here having this conversation today probably. I love it. Plan A always works out when there's no plan B. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. I love it. I absolutely love it. And a lot of times when we're starting out, what we what we think will be our end product or end user or even our target market is not what it ultimately ends up being. And we, we know that. How has that changed and evolved since the, the inception of Builder Comps? Complete change. Uh, so when I originally brought Builder Comps to market is I figured more enterprise bigger construction companies like would be my ideal customer like they're already using software it just makes sense they need a communication solution complete opposite happens go to market boom it's all people that haven't used software it's smaller contractors that are dabbling in using software or they're backing off of big crms so it was like a hold up a minute here the direction we thought this was going to go in, it went in the complete opposite. So that's the original market that I thought I would serve in construction. I don't even serve now. Like that's not, uh, it's, that's like the ones and twos like here randomly. But for the most part, we serve the smaller construction companies that are looking to get into technology and start implementing that. And I would have never seen that coming. Like, I would have never been able to have that conversation a couple of years ago and say, this is the demographic. Uh, but here we are now today, and we thrive in that market. What advice, because that's a very interesting concept, right? And that can be scary for some when they're married to a certain idea or demographic or problem or whatever it is. And then they, they find out that that's not, okay, that, that's not where we live. That's not where we fit. What advice would you give them uh, when making that, that pivot, when, when they have that realization? Don't be married to anything besides the end outcome you're trying to create. Like early stage software, early stage business, everything you're doing, like you're learning along the way. There's going to be pivots. There's going to be changes. Don't be married to any of it, except for that end outcome, that impact, the vision, where you're trying to go. Because I think we get too hung up on like, that like what you just said like oh i have to serve this customer well damn it sometimes that customer don't want your product but this customer does serve that other customer and don't be afraid of it you know like serving people that don't use technology comes with a whole different set of herders than serving bigger companies that understand technology 
but that's like that's part of our pivot that's part of our story and because i'm married to the outcome what we're trying to create here the impact we're going to have on the construction industry the impact this is going to have for my family that end user i would let the market dictate that and i will build the product around that user not who i think should use it because mm -hmm. that's how stuff goes belly up you know my co-founder jared yellen one of the great things that he says about early stage startups is and he's been around a lot of them is that the product is probably not going to be what you thought it would be and your end user it's definitely not going to be who you thought it was going to be when you get to the end point to where you're scaling that company. And the quicker we realize that and the quicker people understand that, the faster you'll get to success. So I think that's one of the reasons me and him work together so well is because he's married to the end outcome as well. Like we know what we built and what it does. It's who does it do it the best for and how can we change the most lives with it? So like, that's what you have to go out and do. Don't be married to who you think your ideal customer is, because I guarantee you it's going to change more than once. Oh, absolutely. So what, what did that, what did that pivot look like for you guys? You realized, okay, we're going to be working now with individuals, companies, smaller companies who don't have as big of a grasp on technology. How did that change your strategy? And what did that pivot look like for you guys? Well, it was, where do they live? Like, so if you're going to start going out and finding people that don't use technology, like where do they live? So I found like they live in Facebook groups and alignable groups and they just, they live in weird places. It wasn't about like going out and doing mass marketing. Like everybody's like, man, you must kill it on LinkedIn. I think I've signed up one customer ever off of LinkedIn. Like my end user doesn't live on LinkedIn. So it's understanding where they hang out and where you put that outbound and that marketing effort into. I mean, most of the people I deal with, like their emails, chances are is probably some, if they have a website, they probably never had the email set up. So when you get their email address, like it goes to nowhere. So like figuring all this stuff out is what you have to do. And it's it's all about the, the pivot within the pivot and understanding that stuff. So once you start to see some traction somewhere, it's like our, our duty as the founder to start going and understanding more about that. Like I didn't, under, it had been a long time since I was at like ground seat zero in construction. Mm -hmm. So I had to go back and be like, what is it like right now for these guys that are starting companies up or aren't using any technology like what are they doing well they're using their phones they're using a pad and pen to run their jobs well where do they hang out where are they conversating at you know is that like at the local hardware store the you know they hang out at gas stations we all know that uh but then it's like in these Facebook groups where they're having these conversations and or on Alignable where they're just looking for like, what's that next thing? So like what I found is that the demographic that I'm going after, it's bigger than most demographics. It's just one of the hardest ones to reach. If you have to make a pivot, empty your cup. And just realize that you don't know and go back into investigation mode. Where are they living? What different types of pain points? How do I communicate? How do they prefer to be communicated to? Because you don't know any of those answers to those questions now. I love yeah. that. So, yeah, exactly what you said. Because all ideal demographic, where we originally go with, who we think is our end user, is probably what we're most knowledgeable about. Mm -hmm. That's why we assume they're the end user. But that's never, very, very rarely is the case. So exactly what you just said is we have to relearn that demographic. Don't assume that you know what that demographic is. What's been the most surprising aspect of, of actually running a scaling business, especially seeing it from zero to where it is now? Uh, I think that the the conception that software runs fast Uh I think software scales fast, but software is inherently slow. 
from every aspect of it, uh, building it, doing all of that. It's just, you don't, you, so you're in building a business, you have to be able to scale people in software. You don't have to scale as many people to scale. So it grows faster, but like that foundation, like getting there, I, I personally think goes slower than mm. what most people have a conception around what software does. So do you say foundation? Elaborate on what you mean by foundation. I, I think like building out software, doing updates, getting the product to where you want it to be takes a lot longer than what most people would think. Like even myself, like the preconceived notion that we have around software and how fast it is, what, what software is fast at is scaling. Because once you have it, you can grow users without having to grow staff as fast as in a typical business. But in the beginning, when you have to build out software, like I feel like sometimes I dove into this nine months to a year too soon, like because I thought it would all be built out a lot faster. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you don't you go back and you think, well, I could have waited to go all in on this. I wouldn't change anything at all how I did it, but like, it just takes time. And we have this conception in our mind that software just happens overnight, but it's really like every other business. It takes time. Got it. So it's to take your time in the beginning to build that foundation that you can build upon and then document mm -hmm. the, the procedures, the systems and processes to keep improving it as time goes on. But all of that's for not if you don't have a solid foundation to build it on. Is that, am I summarizing? Yeah, yeah. I just yeah. think we think that software moves super fast and that has not been my experience. And most people I talk to within software would say the same thing. Like it just doesn't mm -hmm. work that way. What problem predominantly does your, your does Buildercom solve? <laughs> so the problem that I, I set out to solve and how builder comms came about was dealing with angry customers. Like that was why I, how I got down this road. And then like, why does the construction industry have a really piss poor reputation when it comes to customer experiences? And what I could track that back to was, you know, it very rarely was the guys and it was almost never the work. But it was it all came back to communication breakdowns, the customer talking to the wrong person, not hearing back, just not having a clear line of communication. So what Buildercoms does is we fix that. We work as air traffic control for your communications. We get all your pictures, documents, videos all in one place, and we organize them nice and neat per project. So there's no more chasing emails, no more chasing clients. Uh, no more worrying about what your guys are out saying to people because we now have a record of it all and we fix the communication breakdown. What benefits can companies expect when they bring builder comms on? Yeah. So in the construction industry, it's estimated that anywhere between 20 to 40% of time is wasted on projects because of communication breakdowns. I don't, I can't even count the amount of days where I had a crew just sitting at a house, not doing anything because we were waiting on a decision from the homeowner or the homeowner didn't get an email that was sent out. And all it did was burn revenue. It ate into all profits and it's missed opportunities as well. That crew couldn't get to the next project in time. We got to move the calendar around. That's one of the main benefits Here's a hidden benefit that's come out of this is your customers, because we're running it through an app for them, respond faster when you inquire about something because it's not an email. It's not a text message. They don't think it's a friend. They don't think it's work. When they get that builder comms notification, they know it's about their project and it's probably time sensitive. So we start cutting down the, uh, the time turnaround time for your communication with your homeowners. And then that third piece is that air traffic control is that we keep that customer talking to the right people at your company. So if they have a scheduling question, they're talking to the person that hands or handles the schedule. They're not talking to the receptionist that has no idea what's going on with it. So those are three very critical benefits that builder comms very quickly can start to solve for your business. 
So they can expect when they work with builder comms, increased customer satisfaction, which then in better reviews, more referrals, more revenue, and the the decrease in your deal graveyard, as I like to call it, which <laughs> deals that they, they, they got lost somewhere because of lack of communication, right? And mm-hmm. they just fizzled out, right? The, the, the customer found somebody else or maybe they, you know, they change their mind. Like, I don't need new roof. I don't need a new roof or I don't need new siding or I don't need new windows or whatever it is anymore because I want to buy a new car, whatever it is. Right. <laughs> so it cuts down on that deal graveyard. And I think a lot of companies would be surprised if they did the math, even if they closed, you know, if they looked at their deal graveyard and they closed 25% of them. I think they'd be pretty surprised in the revenue that they could generate with that. Oh, it's one of the most untapped. I mean, we could do a whole show on what because we did a major focus on this at one point in time because even when you're closing at 27 to uh 30 percent 70 percent of your deals are going away and your competition's not getting that mm-hmm. chances are over 50 percent of those customers just didn't do anything like that's all biggest mm-hmm. competitors they just don't make a decision so being able to get back in there you can close those deals at a higher percentage if you can get back into that house. What is the summit that you want builder comms to achieve? So from day one, it has been to help 5 million people in construction with communication. If I can start to, if we can have that impact, or when we have that impact, we start fixing communication throughout the entire industry. The ripples that would be felt from that would cause the last 40 years of reports that communication is one of the biggest breakdowns in construction projects to go away. We can start delivering better customer experiences because we've infiltrated the market enough that the bar has changed. It has been raised on how we communicate with our customers and what this looks like. So the summit builder comms is chasing is to help 5 million builders and contractors with their communication. I'm going to drop the mic for you, Ron. That was amazing. I always appreciate having you on. And for everybody listening, this is the reason that we do what we do is, is, Obviously, Ron Ron's extremely intelligent. He has the business basics. He knows how to solve problems. But the, the the people who identify the problems, who maybe don't have an MBA or didn't have you know a mom and dad who had a business growing up, so they could learn the basics. Right? They went out. They identified a problem. They put their hand up. You're like, I'm going to be the guy to solve this problem. And they put it on their back. Right? So, Ron, thank you so much for coming on. I can't wait for everybody to see this one, and we will catch you in the next one bit of our uh, cohesiveness and hopefully strive (laughs) to find someone that they can do that with themselves.